Hello! Welcome to another Café Rollis, another random encounter, thanks to Twitter, thanks to a, a fan of the Rollis who recommended I get in touch with Kyle, who I forgot to double check with that it, the pronunciation was Kyle, is it? It is Kyle, yes, that's absolutely correct. Great. Uh, not many people get it right the first time, yeah. Yeah, for a while I to to remain in the nautical sort of vac vocabulary, I was wondering if it would be Kiel. But uh, yeah, no Kyle it is. Could you introduce yourself to the, the listeners and the viewers uh, of the show? By the way, I will be the only one showing wacky reactions to everything we say, uh, because sadly uh, your video is not, is not available. But instead, we've got a, a beautiful uh, picture of you, which everybody can enjoy. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, my name is Kyle Chenier. I'm a independent tabletop role-playing game designer and creator. Um, I've worked sort of all over the industry and done a lot of stuff. Uh, I'm also one of the lead creators at Birch and Bat. Um, it's a tabletop gaming and apparel studio. Oh, that's funny that you're also an apparel studio because you got Birch in the name. And Chris mm -hmm. Birch here, who founded Mod, if you started with apparel and then moved on into uh, role-playing games. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we got a, a couple ice-breaking questions uh, on the roll list. Uh, we sort of started uh, uh, due to the lockdown and uh, my personal situation. So my first question is, uh, what is the rut your routine at the moment, uh, lockdown or not? Uh, because it, it changes with countries yeah, so and regions lately. Yeah, it's, it's funny because uh, I work from home a lot because of our company. Like most of the work we, where we don't have like an independent studio, it's all within our home. Um, but yeah, self-isolation has uh, not changed anything too, too dramatically. Uh, it's just if I, I, I usually I make coffee at home a lot more now than going out for it, I guess. Myself? Oops. I'm putting coffee everywhere as, as you're saying that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. So, so I guess you have not either uh, picked up any new uh, hobby, skill, or interest uh, lately? I... Uh, not exactly. Um, I'm doing a lot more illustration work on the side for our store. Um, I'm also, I, until I had the big crunch to get Weird on the Waves finished, I actually started running more games as well. I, I think at my most, I was running maybe four uh, role-playing game sessions a week for friends online. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm a game master most of the time when it comes to these kind of things, and I have a couple of groups that I run for. Uh, hopefully they might be in the Twitch chat if any of them are up early enough on our end. Then not um, yet, maybe later. So if they do, I uh, hope they will have questions for you, maybe. They, they can put you on the spot regarding uh, stuff happening in your campaign. So uh, today I know you are extremely keen to tell us about where it on the wave. So what is it? Yeah. What is it about? Why should people rush right now? to purchase it because it's it's available for purchase now or it is available for purchase yeah. at long last it's finally finished and it's finally available as a digital pdf that can be bought uh so long story short weird on the waves is a pirate setting for fantasy role-playing games if you play dungeons and dragons or if you play uh dungeon world or any other sort of like fantasy rpg that is like d20 based uh this will work for it um, it is basically, it is a way of like accurately playing pirates to like the 17th century or so of the Caribbean. M the reason I made this book was years ago, I started, to, I played in a couple of people's pirate campaigns and realized, oh, it, every time people run pirates in these games, it's mostly just, well, we're on a boat. Oh, we fought some skeletons. And we're just doing regular Dungeons and Dragons type stuff, but this time we're on a boat instead of in a field or in a dungeon. And that didn't that didn't really feel like true to pirates to me. So yeah, there's so much going more going yeah. on to to pirates. I mean, from even the stuff I, I find it very interesting. Uh, having a quick look at your book, that uh, uh, first of all, the the wave master and wave crawlings are great terms mm -hmm. uh, as alternatives to dungeon crawling uh, and game dungeon mastering. But you know, the, the, you. even this concept of attrition you have is in some dungeons, if you put that on a boat, 
that's very important. I remember reading, um, what's it called in English? There's a book which was attributed wrongly to uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, which apparently is still a reference when you, you're interested into pirates. And mm -hmm. this book included what were allegedly, uh, I think it was a, a, a pages from the diary of Blackbeard. And one of the things yes. which is amazing is it's got this series of pages which is like, okay, uh, today we're starting on running low on uh, alcohol on board. So the crew is getting nervous. And then you got that for mm -hmm. two more pages. Yeah, I still haven't found a, a boat yet uh, to attack. Uh, it's starting to be a problem. For four days, uh, the crew is getting really angry. I think they're gonna come after me. Uh, and then 50 years, oh, yeah. like, oh, no, that was that was a very real thing back then. Uh, it's interesting. So, Weird on the Waves is set in sort of an alternate 17th century Earth. Like, I, I do a lot of historical settings with my role playing game stuff. Um, and because of that, I had to do a lot of different types of research to try to try and get like the feel of sort of buccaneers of just before the golden age of piracy and trying to get that as not, not just sort of as accurate as possible, but just sort of to like to capture the feel of that. And and yeah, like running, running low on rum or running low on the supplies for things that would prevent scurvy and other things were real problems back then. It's a it's quite it's quite fascinating the the logistics of it. Uh, the mm -hmm. uh, I was listening yesterday to a, a podcast about something much more well, not that recent, but much more recent still, uh, by Dan Carlin about the, the Pacific War, and it was explaining how the rule of logistics, just feeding your men and resupplying in s them and stuff. Uh, it's it's quite fascinating to picture that in in the age of piracy first, and then second, mm -hmm. uh, picture that for organizations which are uh, not governmental, uh, you know, that they are, uh, well, from point of view, independent or, or, or criminal. So, or do you do you resupply or do you find your things or do you have a ship uh, fixed and, and all this sort of things? It's, it's quite mind-boggling as a, an organization what's going on on a boat. Oh, absolutely. Like the going into the logistics of like how because sailors at that time, like early buccaneers and privateers of that era would spend anywhere between like six months to almost two years or more like at sea going from port to port and from uh, essentially from uh, uh, from island to island and it was really fascinating like how did they get food what was abundant here how did they get uh, the supplies they needed to keep living because living on one of those ships back then was terrible like the conditions were awful and it was very difficult to do um, it was really challenging to try and make to make game mechanics to sort of make that feel authentic to the era but also not be like a slog to play through and to keep track of organization i tried to make it as simple as possible while also being uh, make it feel as if it fits into the setting really well yeah, it's a it's a tough line to to follow. How do you balance storytelling, adventure, and kind mm -hmm. of a, uh, yeah the 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 mechanics of of having thing all of that seem to to matter in the your adventures and in your story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. Uh, Word on the Waves uses a couple of different resources that the players can use. There's uh, provisions which is the food and water that you need. Uh, every point of provisions you have is enough to feed uh, yourselves and your sailors for a number of days. Uh, there's also a lot of the, the nitty gritty stuff of like the, the sort of like, how do we make repairs for a ship? How do we do this? What are, how do we get more sailcloth and stuff like that? It's handled under a point system called materials, where if you have a certain amount of gold pieces worth of materials, you can safely make repairs. You can save, and you can like, you can, when you plunder a ship on the sea in Weird of the Waves, you can, once you've uh, defeated a crew and sort of taken them aboard, you can either take their ship and sail it yourself and claim it as your own, or you can completely break it down and scuttle it for supplies. That way you have your own materials to rebuild your own ship. So do you, did you integrate the, because that's, that's sort of a classic also of uh, pirate stories, um, some kind of... Uh, you know the psychology, the intimidation of a 
ship battle, this moment when the pirate ship shows up and you got the ship, which might not be a military ship, having this moment of saying, okay, do we surrender or do we put out a fight or is that up to the game master to decide, okay, those people... Oh, is, is it, it is. It's 100% a part of Weird on the Waves because most, uh, most confrontations between early buccaneers and merchants especially at the beginning of the golden age of piracy most of those encounters ended without a single shot being fired because if a merchant ship was too slow and they were to be overtaken a lot of times they would just straight up surrender and uh, perhaps some of it is fanciful out of history and perhaps we some of us have like an idealistic view of pirates but oftentimes there are stories of pirate crews taking the wealth and taking the treasure and then either uh taking some of the crew that they needed if they needed more manpower if they needed more sailors and then leaving the rest of them to go about their way um, other pirates were far more mature notorious and like were very bloodthirsty but yeah in weird on the waves if you approach a merchant ship and you make a force of intimidation oftentimes they'll surrender and you just collect your treasure and move on your way uh, but other times like especially guarded merchant ships like all of them have stats in the game a lot of them are going to put up a fight so uh i think you started this project or you you first announced this project in 2017 is that right i was actually i think a little bit earlier than that but yeah it's been a number of years that this has been in development um i started it as a essentially like a holiday fundraiser and because I needed a, a new project that I needed to work on and I needed to get through the holidays and started it out, got the very early work done on it. But as life went on and as things kept happening, like it just the development time on it went on and on and on. And the book became sort of bigger and bigger in scope. When I first started, this was supposed to only be like a 60 page supplement uh, for like really basic D&D games. And as time went on, I was like, oh, wait, now I can actually make this into a really sort of like large supplement, a very sort of like robust kind of game. Uh, it's it's far bigger and far more complex than, than I had originally anticipated. Yeah, your introduction says that uh, at first you thought it would take you around four months to, to pull off. Oh, yeah. I... I in every update email I've sent, I've, uh, I've apologized to the, the original people that backed it and bought it because it, it took so long to produce. Uh, and, and the deadlines that I had set up originally were well past. Uh, but hopefully the uh, the final result is worth it. Yeah, I hope, let's hope so. Uh, I was wondering about the, the timeline because I told you, yeah, reading that it, it started in 2017 or earlier than that. Uh, I think it's in the middle of 20, 2018. Uh, suddenly piracy in D&D became even more fashionable when Critical Role got on their own ships with the, the Mighty Nine. I was wondering if it was a blessing or a curse to have something uh, like that happen that it brought a spotlight on your game or on the contrary brought some some competition uh, in terms of uh, with similar projects uh i would actually say that it has had almost no impact whatsoever on this book the the audience the original audience for this game and the audience for critical role were very different uh when i started um, I would say there's there's much more overlap now with the works I do for Birch and Bat, for the, the works that I have done for official D&D. Now there is a, a much more overlap. At the time, uh, I hadn't actually been following Critical Role at all. I, I didn't even know. Um, no, the, the, the thing that actually gave me pause was Wizards of the Coast officially released their own sort of sailing rules book in the Ghosts of Saltmarsh, and that was roughly six months before Weird on the Waves came out. Um, I, very thankfully, though, there's very little overlap with those two books. They, they work in tandem. Like, you can run Ghosts of Saltmarsh using the rules in Weird on the Waves and vice versa. Which, which is great. Uh, so then you can buy was... do it both and uh, the complementary. Absolutely. So, yeah, but the... Like that book is that book is much more sort of traditional D and D, whereas Weird on the Waves is very much about like playing pirates while there's also monsters going on. 
Well, it's interesting that you picked. Uh, I, I was a, a bit surprised when I saw the Caribbean mentioned in the book because what I expected was a welcome to the fantasy world of. I mean, it, it's still a fantasy world, but uh, why were you uh, so it, th that that universe of the game? Or how much is it all world, but not all world at the same time? Um. So. This implied setting of Weird on the Waves is set in uh, the year 1666. Uh, it's set in the Caribbean Sea between the islands of Cuba um, and what, what was at the time called Hispaniola. Um, it's the way that it's sort of set up is that uh, several years prior, people started noticing something strange about the ocean. Uh, there were more and more sort of strange ocean mutants coming about. Uh, there were strange uh, sort of like odd instances of magic and other weirdness. And by the time the time of the game comes around, the entirety of these islands has been completely isolated by this sort of a magical a barrier of fog that has surrounded it and separated it from the rest of the world. People can get in, but people in the Caribbean can't get out. On the opposite side, there's now an alternate world of various islands. Um, like sort of alien worlds around them. And the game is sort of about if the new world is completely cut off from the old world, how would they continue to operate on their own when now they're truly sort of on their own? And this was around a time and an era when that was sort of going on to begin with. The powers that be in the new world were starting to wonder, do we actually need the forces of the old world? Do we need the monarchies of England and France and Spain? Or can we become our own independent nations? It's Yeah, I was wondering about that because I, I'm a big, big proponent of playing in historical settings, but doing so, there's a uh, editorial slash curatorial work of what mm -hmm. topics of reality or understanding of the historical realities play into the game and uh, I mean just yesterday here in the UK we got rid of a statue of someone uh, from uh, the UK who made a lot of money through uh, shipping slaves. Uh, mm -hmm. Slavery is, is a big part of the the mythos. Uh, it's, I guess it, yeah, it's part of it and at the same time it's adjac adjacent to, to questions of uh, piracy as uh, much as mm -hmm. uh, religious and uh, sexual li liberty. Uh, how much of those... Uh, did you include any of those political side of things uh, to, to your game? To a certain extent. Um, I made a blog post about this uh, shortly after as well, discussing sort of the realities of that time period are present, but because it is a piece of alternate reality where events from that time period diverge in a much more fantastical way, um, there is definitely a more idealistic uh, bent to it and a more idealistic view of pirates than what was, what has sort of become more and more historically held as truth. Um, there, there's a very romanticized view of pirates, um, especially in the West, of them being sort of like pioneers of anti-authoritarianism and being Uh, some of the uh, the very first people to take a stand against tyranny, against uh, the, uh, the the assorted trades of monarchy as well, um, and that is present in Weird on the Waves. Uh, but there is also a lot of framework for people who want to use it in their own fantasy settings. If you want to remove the any sort of uh, piece of the historical uh, parts of the setting, you are more than welcome to. It is. It helps form the basis of it because it's easier to talk about pirates when you can also talk about cannons and gunpowder and the kinds of goods brought over by uh, or traded primarily by like West India companies and things like that. Um, but if you want to go completely without any historical details, you absolutely can. There's a wide spectrum of actually what can be a pirate. I mean, you you start with the. Mm -hmm. Halloween costumes for children and uh, 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 the um, Treasure Island with the Muppets and you go all the way to 
black sails with somewhere in between uh, Pirates mm-hmm. of the Caribbean and uh, Cutthroat Island. Uh, when when do you play? Do you have a, a reference, a frame of reference, a movie or a show which you think uh, fits more what you have in mind? Which is not necessarily what others might play with Weird on the Waves, but what what is your own uh, when you were writing it? Oh, so while I was writing it, uh, primary inspirations were actually bits of history. Um, I used a lot of uh, sort of historical documents about pirates, different books. Um, Under the Black Flag is a really, really good uh, sort of historical account of various forms of piracy over the years. For media, uh, Black Sails uh, from Stars ended up being a really, really good show to sort of uh, gauge sort of the realities of that time period and the realities of sailing on the open ocean and what it takes to muster a crew and what it takes to survive in a, uh, a world where piracy had needs to become a way of life for survival. Um, but I'm also a total goofball. So when I run it at home, like Muppet Treasure Island is a very big influence. Um, just because when I, when I tend to run games for my own groups and the, uh, the atmosphere that I like to bring out when, I, when I'm a game master, Uh, it is very sort of like more comedic. I love. I just love Black Sails. That's a uh, that's a show. It's uh, real good. Completely devoured, and uh, you know we people were reminiscing uh, of the end of Game of Thrones uh, a year ago. Uh, Black Sails is one of the the few shows which really come up with a very interesting ending. I don't want to spoil it, mm-hmm. but it's. It's just yeah. It was for me. It was chef kiss uh, about all the characters, the way they, they developed and felt contemporary, yet at the same time, uh, yet yeah, telling something about the the age in which uh, the they're supposed to to be uh, taking place. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, if, it, it, anyone listening who has not seen Black Sails, uh, it's wonderful. Like it's it's a really good show for that. I know it's this, I think it's the same producer. I haven't checked Vikings yet. Uh, I don't know if it's as have, good yeah. or similar on in any way. I would say if you're if you've seen Vikings, uh, it has a very similar vibe and a very similar feel, um, especially in its first season or so. Um, I think Vikings is a show that has improved over time, um, and, and by the same way, Black Sails is I think also only like three seasons, so it's only about maybe 30 episodes total. Like you can watch it in a, in like a week. Yeah, and it moves so well. Quite fast, and yeah, you're always on the edge of your seat. Also, there's a lot of mm-hmm. mini cliffhangers. You when you're rooting for a specific character, you're like, oh, what's gonna happen to to her? Uh, what the, <laughs> who is she gonna deal with with that situation? It's uh, it's really really good. I think it would have deserved more attention than it has. Uh, it had, I think, a bit of attention, but yeah, the, mm-hmm. not on par with uh, its merits. Uh, what was I about to say? Um, did you? I, I know it's always a bit uh, uh, a tricky t- topic I find with with game designers. Uh, I can't imagine why because I, I'm 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 starting to be a game designer myself. But uh, did you have any research and or interest in other role playing games which already ventured in the the realm of piracy? Were some of them influential or on the opposite like okay this one does this thing that's not the thing i want to do on the country i want to go in, uh, in that other direction ab- absolutely yeah so I- I- exactly that last point um with throwing absolutely no shade at any other nautical or pirate games because these games are hard to make like making something like that is an incredible task like originally when i first started this project i thought yeah i could write about pirates that'll be easy i how hard could it be and then it takes me three years to come <laughs> up with a lot of this stuff like it is it is a challenge um the reason i came up with weird on the waves to begin with was because i wasn't finding a lot of the sort of cutthroat actions of pirates within a lot of these other nautical and pirate games so many times it felt like again it, the dungeons and dragons except instead of with uh carriages or wagons it was with ships or it was a lot of like fighting basically like a a sailing ship in D for a lot of games was just a place to fight uh giant squid or skeleton pirates on and that's all it was 
uh, I really wanted to make a game where the goal was to be pirates. The goal was to set out on a voyage, plunder as much as you can and get as much treasure and wealth from other ships and from islands as you could, and then return to safe port before you get hunted down by other privateers or navies. Um, because no other games like Seven C, like uh, some a lot of the D and D supplements, like of Ships in the Sea, or um, a lot of the the Pathfinder, Razor Coast kind of things, um, none of them were really providing what I what I kind of wanted to see. So, as with the case of most other projects I've worked on, it became it's like well if it's, if no one else is making it, I might as well. Because uh, a, a lot of my projects that I've worked on in the past have sort of come about that way. Yeah, it's often the way you you find a, something is missing and you want to fill that gap, especially well, of mm -hmm. course, when it's something you're you're into. I, I was wondering, yeah, uh, as as you were talking, I was making a, a quick little research online because there's a one of the the, the very first role playing game I had in PDF format, uh, and at the time it it was for free. Uh, is a pirate role-playing game but a French one and I was just googling quickly to find out if there was a, an English version available sadly not because it's called Pavillon Noir uh, Black Flag oh, cool. uh, by Renaud Marois and uh, I even checked the, the latest editions because it was re-edited since then uh, but it was probably in terms of uh, trying to be thorough and exhaustive regarding a, a historical setting uh, that, that was one of the most interesting uh, I found I really wish my for 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 your sake and English listeners that it was available in somehow in a, an English version, but uh, apparently the the noir. yeah, I'm I'm looking it up now. Like that actually looks really cool. I'm gonna have to check that. Out. I I researched a lot of different settings, but that must have escaped me. Um, I'm gonna have to check that out because yeah, it looks very cool. Yeah, that's the thing with a bit with my show. I'm trying to <laughs> to have different. Uh, sphere of languages uh, run over each other. I must say things have been pretty good those last few years because there's more and more things being translated uh, yeah, translated in, in general and especially mm -hmm. from from Spanish to... Uh, I mean uh, speaking of historical sort of settings yet fantasy uh, Chaosium just announced they will be distributing a, g a game called Aquelare which is a Spanish game set uh, maybe 15th century. It's, it's not nautical in any oh, cool. way, but it's sort of... Uh, you play in... I guess it's uh, picture the worst nightmares of the Spanish Inquisition and let's say the, the, what they imagine is sort of real yeah. and you play in that world. So the, the game is rooted in this uh, visually also uh, it's a gorgeous looking book and I'm, I'm very happy to when I found out that Chaosium would start distributing it but uh, yeah maybe they, cool. they, maybe they can take on that, Pavillon Noir after that <laughs> yeah absolutely I'll have to check that out because yeah that, that absolutely sounds like it would be up Chaosium's alley They're, they, they have a very deft hand when it comes to tackling uh, that kind of subject matter but what's quite interesting is when uh, you found out, like, uh, one of my last guests on the show was from Sweden, and they are kickstarting a game both in English and French at the same time, and they got a deal between uh, Helmgas, Swedish publisher, Modifius, uh, English London-based publisher, and Arcane Edition mm -hmm. in France, and they work all together to sort of corner the market with their product and have exchanges and osmosis in what they do so it's it's quite cool when uh, when this sort of things are happening uh but uh, i'm absolutely side, i'm sidetracking uh tell us about uh birch and bat so what do you do yeah. beyond the uh, word on the on the waves is it built on the shoulders of uh, word on the waves uh, no, I would say the opposite. Uh, <laughs> Weird on the Waves was built on the shoulders of what, what is made by Birch and Bat. Uh, Birch and Bat is my independent game studio I run with my partner, Arella. Um, it is, you can just go to birchandbat.com to check it out. We make tabletop gaming PDFs and supplements. Like I, I've been a RPG designer and adventure writer for uh, almost six years now, I think. Um, well, my partner Arella and I, we have, uh, we also sell merchandise as well. Uh, we have t shirts, phone cases, uh, stickers. Uh, stickers are huge right now with a lot of our products. Um, and we come up with a variety of like 
role-playing game related stuff uh like designs and things using d20s and uh uh like we have a variety of different products and things we have uh floral d20 designs based on classes and based on different themes that we have on a variety of apparel and merchandise um we've got a whole bunch of uh of products in the works as well for new things uh but yeah it expanded on that all my all the things that I've published so far for role-playing games and supplements and things like that, they're all live on birchandbat.com. So what do you mean floral? Because I didn't see that on the, the website. So imagine a D20 and imagine it is surrounded by uh, flowers and greenery that is reflective of a D&D class. Oh, um, nice. Like I have, we have a, a really... Uh, wonderfully selling necromancer design which has a lot of uh, uh, darker and funerary florals around it as well as like a bird skull and a few other sort of like tidbits and details that reflect a necromancer they're gorgeous and they look amazing on a variety of things um, we also have we also have other simpler text designs uh, for like we have dungeon master mugs we have things like vampire apologist mugs or uh, <laughs> uh, party mom or party dad mugs uh, all kinds of different products uh, for my own stuff I have a uh, one of my original uh, independent published things I have a haunted house adventure if if you do like weird on the waves I suggest you check out my adventure the hell house beckons. It is the ultimate haunted house and uh, sort of adventure and toolkit. If you're ever interested in running horror or a haunted house style adventure, it is a really useful book to have. Is that a horror house? Uh, what sort of universe? Is it, is it contemporary, 20s or medieval fantasy uh, or, or agnostic? I would say it's medieval. I, I would say it's more agnostic. It can be used with any sort of D20 based game. You can put it into any setting. It's made for sort of a Dungeons and Dragons style um, sort of fantasy setting, but it's also, it has just enough contemporary details that you could put it in a historical setting or you could sort of raise it up to be sort of a, a, a hammer style 1970s horror uh, gothic adventure. Uh, you can use it in a variety of settings and a variety of games. So speaking of adventure and coming back to where it on the waves, uh, I find this it changing slightly now, nowadays, but for, for a while we had a lot of new games coming out and, and they were mainly a core book and then you write your own adventures and there was no... I know it's difficult for, for smaller publishers, but the, it was difficult to have a, a follow-up in terms of having a... Uh, written campaign or uh, written adventures uh, are you gonna follow word on the wave with a, a variety of, of supplements or are you moving on to other exciting projects um i have a couple of other things in the works at the moment um in the future i might supplement weird on the waves with more adventures and more uh like to fill out that world a little bit um i have a variety of other things i'm working on right now for uh for both the store and for Uh, basically, at the moment, I'm trying to make uh, as many sort of adventures and supplements and things that will be compatible with as many systems as possible. Very, very sort of uh, system agnostic. And uh, yeah, we, we were talking about Birch and uh, Bat. Uh, you even have a podcast which you launched uh, this month. So, mm -hmm. or last month. So, what is it about? The, is it focusing on... Uh, showcasing your your own work or do you review other people's work or do you have just uh, random ramblings uh? Uh, I, would, i would definitely say it it, it does hew closer to to random ramblings uh it's uh myself and my partner arella we talk about whatever fantasy role-playing game sort of thing is most sort of pressing on our minds at the moment um We, I don't think we're going to be doing reviews with it, but this show is very, it's sort of like a loose sort of breakfast morning time show uh, that you can listen to any time. Uh, it's, we're mostly just going to be talking about the things that sort of we want to talk about in the moment. And that can be a variety of things. Was right now we have episodes about like, first one was about our, our favorite characters that we've played and our first characters. And the one after that was our favorite uh 
favorite homebrew settings that we have made in the past and like what's come out of that and where that sort of creativity drives us. So was it already your partner? Because I listened, I told you I was listening to a, another show you were on, but it was not uh, Birch and Bath yet, uh, in which you, you was speaking of Ninja. Was it already your, your co-host slash partner so back then? No, that would have been, that was an old show I did. Uh, a few years back. T technically, that was also an any nominated show. Uh, that was uh, Ray and Kyle Can Do. Wow. Uh, I had done that with Reynaldo Madrinian, uh, who works on an RPG with uh, Grey Wizard called Break. Um, Ray and I have been friends for a, a long while, and uh, we've worked together on a variety of things together. Cool. Uh, do you think you, you're going to have some... Are you going to venture into the, the difficult realm of uh, actual play podcast uh, with where the on the waves at some point possibly um i've done here's the thing i've actually done a number of actual play stuff in the past uh to, to varying degrees of success um it's something i'm interested in but i don't know that i have the time uh to devote to it at the moment it's, um, it's very would, time consuming would, editing yeah. <laughs> play. in my views yeah, at I least think, Yeah, I think it's definitely, it's something I'm, I would very much like to do. Um, sometime, probably in the future, I would love to do something like that with Weird on the Waves. Uh, but we will see. I think you should, maybe you should consider getting in touch with, uh, I think it's mainly UK-based, show called uh, Flintlocks and Fireballs, who are uh, already uh, all piratey in their adventures, and uh, they would probably be interested in the, the rules that words on the ways uh, have to uh, to offer i will have to look into that yeah and uh, it comes highly f uh, recommended i'm not a big listener of actual play myself uh, i produce uh, an episode or two of them uh, now and then but uh, to listen it's not it's not quite my thing i i I'm, i need some very specific edit type of editing to to be able to be uh, on board of these uh. mm hmm I can I can definitely relate to that. I'm I'm very picky when it comes to to actual play kind of stuff. I'm I'm a very big fan of a lot of them, uh, but I, I definitely have sort of specific tastes about them as well. Yeah, it's it's sort it's weird. It's like it's different. The, the I think the main thing for me is that I listen to podcasts on while commuting or working, and mm -hmm. listening to a discussion it's fine, but listening to a story, it's it's not the same part of the brain which uh, is involved I guess and also if you miss a bit in a, in a story it's difficult to, to work out uh, what's going on while a discussion it's sort of starting over on a regular basis so you, you, you're not lost that easily mm -hmm. I, would, uh, I would definitely agree with that. that that sounds very familiar to my own experiences so are there other uh, birch and bat products that uh, you'd like to tell us about Oh, yeah. I have uh, a couple of things that might be good to mention. Um, if you're brand new to us, um, you can pick up a couple of free PDFs that we have on the website. Uh, one I highly recommend, because it also works super well with Weird on the Waves, uh, is our uh, free carousing PDF. It's called On the Rocks, full color, illustrated. It is a series of carousing tables and carousing rules for, your, uh, for tabletop role-playing games. So in between fantasy adventures, if your characters want to drink and party it up and then discover a variety of D100 tables of what can happen afterwards, uh, it is a, an amazing resource. Uh, I'd also recommend Word on the Waves is a big one. I have uh, a couple of newer adventures. Uh, one I really recommend is Icorn Knight. Um, previously, I worked with a cartographer, Dyson Logos, um, on his, it, for a short while, he was publishing his own adventures uh, for 5th edition, D&D. &D. Um, I wrote the first one of those called Orcs and Tarot Din's Tomb. It's a very short adventure about orcs. It has random tables to generate your own sort of band of orcs and their names and mannerisms and all kinds of things. Uh, I was commissioned to write a second adventure it was going to be about demons and his that sort of publishing platform for him had folded and he wasn't publishing any more of those so i self-published what i had written icor knights an adventure for like fifth to seventh level characters 
where you are pitted against an entire warren of demons underneath a small town and your job is to sort of figure out how can we how can we banish all of these demons without alerting the town to their presence or else they're going to run roughshod over them so, um, so is that I call knights is that I C H O R and knights like that is uh, the armor wielding uh, knights? Not no uh, knight is in like uh, like uh, Halloween knight. Okay. Or, uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, uh, I call knight. It is a it is a one shot adventure run in a single night about how you can how you too can try and survive an entire night filled with demons. So, uh, speaking of different products and uh, and their promotion, uh, Origins Online is almost uh, upon us, and there's a number of other conventions which, on one hand, are sadly cancelled, but on the mm -hmm. other hand, are moving online, which means for people like me, uh, I can attend, in a, in a form at least, US convention. Are you planning to attend uh, Origins or Gen Con, or we even have the British one moving to the internet uh, UK Games Expo going to a virtual expo. Um, are, have you had a, a look at these, and uh, are you going to attend in any fashion one of them? Um, I have. Uh, I can't promise that I'm going to be at a lot of them just because of scheduling. Um, I'm incredibly busy at the moment. I'm working on a new product line, and I have a couple of other projects in the works. I, it's Basically, when when you do this for a living, it's like it's a lot of work to make sure that there's sort of stuff continuing to come out. Um, the only one I might I might be attending may be um, Gen Con because uh, I know they're looking into digital versions of that. Um, only because I have a couple of products submitted for the EN awards. Um, I don't know if they're going to be nominated. Who knows? But waiting and seeing. Yeah, we hope that would be uh, that would be nice. Great. Uh, anything else you wish to, to talk about? Sadly, we, we don't have a lot of people in the... We don't have anyone in the chat room except a, a bot called Francis. Uh, <laughs> do you have, does do does you have, Francis have any questions? <laughs> I will check, but in the meantime, but is there anything else you want to talk about? Oh, Sardonicus um, was there, but he's not there anymore. Hmm. Oh, he was commenting on... Uh, uh, Games from uh, non-English speaking cultures coming to to the English cultures. Yeah, is there anything else mm -hmm. you want to talk about? Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, no, it's just I, I will say it's been a tremendous relief to finally have this uh, uh, such a, a the, probably the largest project I've ever worked on finally be available because um, the the development time on this was ridiculous and. The amount of work that went on—it basically like two to three years worth of work went into it. Um, it was, it was incredibly gratifying to finally release it and to finally have like a a, a completed and set release date for it uh, after it had been pushed back so often. Um, if for anyone listening who's already checked it out, thank you so much. And uh, for people who haven't, um, I, I hope that it would be worth your time because. Uh, this is this, a lot went into this book to try and make it happen. Actually, we've got Sardonicus in the chat room who's saying uh, he doesn't have any questions, sadly, but uh, he finds that uh, you are talking about a, a lot of good stuff that he is going to look into. Uh, yeah, so I guess it will be time for me to wake up my son from his daily nap. Uh, Thank you very much for joining us. I, I know you had uh, to, to wake up a bit early to, to join us. It's a uh, it's a pleasure. Oh, it's no problem. It's a pleasure having people from across the pond. But uh, since I, I I'm I don't have a lot of liberties uh, with <laughs> my things, uh, it's it's a bit of a challenging uh, sometimes, especially when people no, are that's, around the Pacific. That's totally understandable. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, it's a it's a total pleasure, and uh, I wish I, I remembered who was the. The lovely uh, follower who recommended uh, we get in touch with one another, but uh, thanks. Oh, I believe that was uh, Grey Wiz. Great, um, Grey Wiz, that was it. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Grey yeah. Wiz, uh, if you're listening to if this. You, for he's been a person I've worked with in the past. He did a, uh, He's done a few amazing poster renditions of a couple of my, uh, my RPG adventures. He did a really, really good poster for Blood on the Chocolate. Uh, an old adventure I wrote that won gold at the Ennies a few years back on 2017. Uh, his poster is like the best piece of art that's been made for for that whole adventure. And he 
was gracious enough to follow it up with a really, really good poster for Weird on the Waves, uh, which I, is still somewhere on my Twitter as well. Yeah. So every every time every time I pick up or every time I pitch one of these posters to him, I take an original uh, Hollywood theatrical poster uh, and ask him, it's like, could you do our adventure as like this poster in that style with the text and the credits below it? Like the one he did for Blood on the Chocolate is straight up from the uh, original Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory poster. Uh, you can Google the poster, it'll probably come up in an, a quick search. Uh, but the Weird on the Waves poster is inspired by a the original print cut poster for uh, the pirate movie, which is a I wouldn't say it's a good, it's a good pirate movie. It I believe that was like early 1980s sort of like goofy rom com pirate adventure. Yeah. Oh my God. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I don't, that's the thing. I don't even know if, if the pirate movie, because I think that's just the title of it. Uh, I don't even know if that's available to stream anywhere. So yeah, like if, if that's your only means of getting it, go for it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course. I can absolutely understand that, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's that's always sort of a staple of everything that I make. Yes. I mean, I'm I'm an I'm an openly queer creator in Canada, and that is uh, as as often as I can, I try to make uh, works and adventures and, and products that are as inclusive as possible. Um, it, if only just to, to help make things that like, I can sort of see like myself and feel like me sort of in the world of that. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like he's Gray is is incredibly adept at sort of capturing that sort of vibe. Like I I, I provided him with rough sketches and a few other things um, for uh, for that original poster, and the end product is so much better than I could have imagined it being. He's incredibly talented. Absolutely. So thank you. I wanted to, A, I wanted to make a game where having Mermaid as a core character that you could play as is like front and center. Because I think that that's, it hasn't really been done. There's been a lot of fantasy games that have been like, well, you can be uh, this fantasy version of something that still has legs and still has like, it's still just mostly human, but maybe their skin's slightly tinted and maybe they have fins. Like, no, no, this game's about playing actual, like as depicted in fantasy and like old fairy tales, mermaids and, or mermen or merfolk or however sort of, what, what kind of her kind of character you're playing. Um, but I also introduced the idea because it can be played in a variety of D20 systems and with some of them, character death is very common, especially in like a pirate setting. Uh, I like the idea of like, well, instead of just rolling up a new character, your character can come, if they die at sea, they can come back as a mermaid. You get a certain amount of your old statistics back, um, but now you have sort of a new lease on life uh, plus a new sort of advancement track for your character. Because I thought that was sort of a, a fun idea of of uh, avoiding sort of traditional character death and having a good way to sidestep that while still being interesting. It is. Yep. Uh, similar to other games that I have uh, published and made in the past, uh, there is an entirely random advancement track for this. Um, it's a D100 table. Uh, if you're playing old style D and D systems, you every time you level up, you roll twice on it. For something like fifth edition, um, you gain uh, these advancements similar to how you would gain feats or uh, ability score advancements. And every time you roll one of these D one hundreds, you could get extra spells, you could get new skills, more health, very basic kind of things. Uh, but in the upper side of it, there is like very specific kind of things, like you can get bioluminescent scales so you can kind of uh illuminate areas around you underwater you can get uh like shark teeth so you have a now you now have a bite attack or you have uh, of like healing phytoplankton that your uh your mermaid <laughs> body can sort of exude uh, that can heal your companions uh there's all kinds of wacky little sort of like almost like mutations uh that your characters can acquire over time Awesome! I love uh, randomized things uh, like that. It's uh, the the my pseudonym Damn. actually uh, Kalum is from a character playing a game called Nephilim, and the, most of the development oh, cool. most of the development of the character came through uh, random roles uh, because he, mm -hmm. he, he was a pacifist, and then uh, Nephilim you can travel through e different eras, and as he came back through a vortex from the Arthurian time to present day, uh, for some reason he. he he was granted a massive bonus into strategy, so he became a mm. sort of de facto warlord, but sort of fighting for peace at the same time. But it, it, oh, cool. it totally shaped the character in a very interesting corner, which was, okay, he wants, he wants peace and cohabitation, but there's a war going on, so what is he doing about that? And he's got these skills, mm -hmm. so he ended up leading armies. But that's something I would never have thought of with other random tables so i always think it's it's great for prompts and creativity to have the constraints Absolutely. sort of it that. is it, it is one of my favorite elements about role-playing games is the integrating random tables into not just helping to develop the story but helping to like flesh out scenes of like because it always creates new possibilities that you wouldn't might have thought of just on your own um all all of my work uh, especially all my work on Birch and Bat does lean heavily on uh, random tables and a certain amount of random generation and uh, multiple endings to adventures and things like that. 
Um, but yeah, if if this sort of mermaid class sounds interesting to people, like it's well worth the price of the book just on its own. Like I've used that mermaid class in a variety of different games, uh, not just ones that I'm using Weird on the Waves for, but like now it's like a staple of my Dungeons and Dragons play. Yeah, I will look into Weirds on the Waves and merge it with uh, a French universe I played within uh, called uh, Archipel. Uh, it was a D&D third edition, not even third point five edition, uh, in mm-hmm. which the the world was uh, populated by islands, but the islands were moving around. So it was a bit like a yeah. fast paced constellation, and the some the most the wealthiest and biggest island would move in a more predictable pattern. So that's why life settled on them a bit more, but random islands could show up like a meteorite through um, through the sea so uh, finding your way around was was quite cool and uh, the the explanation for the islands also could become something uh, to to introduce flight but uh, yeah i think uh, it's really we, cool yeah one another one which would be cool to be honest i don't know what the second edition is like of this game uh, they slightly changed the the title but uh, yeah, I love the concept of the first edition, but it it didn't age that well. Uh, it's a uh, early two thousand late nineties French game, and uh, some sensibilities, you know, they they didn't age that well. It's a bit sexist and this sort of things. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah. some... like as as someone who started playing role playing games around that era, like that's when I kind of got my start. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff from from that era of RPGs in that that big boom in the early 2000s that just it, it don't hold up <laughs> well it brought us here and hopefully here it's better and and tomorrow will mm-hmm. be even better let's let's hope so with more more queer representation and uh, 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 not only representation but uh, what's the word uh representatives uh in position mm-hmm. to to be as creative as as they want to be and uh, and uh, diverse uh, ethnicities as well. Uh, on that, I really need to go. Uh, do, do what's your goodbye, and uh, where can people find you? Uh, I assume you wish to be found. Oh yeah. Uh, again, my name is Kyle Chenier. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. It's just at Kyle Chenier. Uh, K i e l c h e n i e r. Um, big place to find all of the work that I do. Um, you can also follow Birch and Bat on Twitter, just Birch and Bat. Um, also, just birchandbat.com. That's where all of my that's where all my work lives. That's where uh, like our podcast goes. Uh, if you're at all interested uh, from things that I've done, um, everywhere else that I work and everything else that I've made can be found there. Amazing. Uh, for me, I was Kaloum. Uh, thank you very much for listening or watching to this show. Uh, if you were listening to this before Origins Online takes place on the I think 19th, 20th and 21st, I will be running sessions of my own game, uh, Paris Gondo, The Life-Saving Magic of Inventorying. There, uh, a dozen sessions, and I'm, I'm very scared that no one signs up to those sessions. So please go ahead go there and for once those sessions will be uh, during the weekend and at times which should be appropriate for uh, players in uh, in the US time zone so so please please come visit me uh, at Origins Online I will put links uh, towards information in the description of this episode as well as links to uh, everything uh, you're doing Kyle so people can find them easily and and I will throw Grey Wizard in there also so to thank him uh, it's not like I've got millions of people clicking on these but this way people can check out his awesome art uh, for uh, Weird on the Waves as well as Blood in the Chocolate mm-hmm. thank you very much cheers bye see you